Papua New can change actual trains on the Raritan Valley. On the Raritan Valley, Valley, Valley line, correct. which is the Plainfield line. In fact, I had a house on Second Street that was behind the train. Right. 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 Okay. Right. Years ago. Right. So the idea is that I would have to stop in Newark and then change and get on the train, the uh, uh, New Jersey Transit going to New York or or the path or whatever. Right. Okay. Right. So if we if if it was done where the Raritan Valley line went directly to New York. Stopped in Newark, but continued to go on. Didn't have to change trains. Would that take money from Newark? Well, I mean... Who would you have to fight up there? I, I don't think you would have to fight anyone. I mean, it might take money away from the Hudson newsstand because okay. they're selling papers. Sure. Or it might take from the vendors in the New York in, in the Newark train station. Sure. But they're still getting the same fees whether you stop and unload and reload as they would if you stop and stage into Manhattan, just like all the other rail okay. lines of New Jersey. Trade. So that wouldn't bother the, the tariff that's coming, I guess, from no, the, no, the stop at all? No. Okay. No. And, and the reality of it is, is that every time another train line did this, mm -hmm. the growth around that area was explosive. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. And so if we got 20 more people living along the Raritan Valley line, when we started with 100, okay, not, not literally 20 more people, but just for going back to our analogy. We now have 20 extra people that are paying that $100 tax bill, which means that the tax bill for each individual is less than a dollar. Okay. So we're reducing taxes, right? That's the first part. But we haven't done anything that has really cost anybody. We haven't cut any programs. We haven't done anything like that. What we've done is we've thought of ways creatively to expand the tax base. Okay. When 20 new people move into that town of 100, sure. businesses are going to follow. Sure. Dry cleaners, um, convenience stores, grocery stores, uh, painters, hardware supply, everyone that's going to support those, those 20 extra people are now going to be looking into that area. So now you've also got an increase in the business tax revenue. Okay. And you've got an even more desirable situation for more people to want to locate there because now your 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 community is beginning to really build up. It's beginning to look valuable. It's beginning to look like a place you want to be. Okay. You look at Summit, you look at Westfield, you look at a lot of towns around the 22nd district where they've kind of built up around the the downtown area sure. um, and, and it becomes a destination. It's not just a place you have to stop at to get right. somewhere sure, else. Sure, sure, sure. It becomes a destination. That, that was another idea that I had about, about generating revenue. Okay, now let me ask you this right here. So if you got an office, what would you who would you have to convince to get this plan? Well, you know, I mean, like, the, the president has to go to Congress. Sure. In, in the case of assemblymen, who do they go to? Sure. Well, the assembly, first of all, is is the, where the budget originates from. Okay. Right? Um, in the case of New Jersey Transit, 30% of their budget comes from the state of New Jersey. Okay. Here's what I find ironic. One of my opponents, Linda Stender, is the vice chair of the Transportation Committee. She lives in Fanwood. Yes. And yet the Raritan Valley Line is the worst rail line in the New Jersey transit system. So for me, to get back to your question, the the person that, that we would need to influence as a representative of the 22nd district is New Jersey transit. And the okay. way you do that is you say, look, my constituents travel to and from New York every day on the worst line in the New Jersey transit system. Okay. I'm on the transportation committee which oversees funding of 30% of your budget and I believe that we can do better. That's the way I would approach it. It doesn't require an act, it doesn't require a bill or sure. legislation or a law or something to be signed by the governor. What it, what it takes is some creative thinking outside of the normal political thought process okay. that says, oh, we don't have enough money, let's raise taxes. Sure, sure. You know, let's figure out something else. Going back to the, the original question, the other thing that I think will help us reduce taxes is to reduce cost. Now, people are going to say, oh, well, you, you want to, you're going to cut programs, you're going to do this. No, we're not. We're going to reduce the corruption. Do you know how much corruption costs this state in dollars? Sure. 
A lot of corruption. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. So how are we going to how are we going to reduce uh, 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 corruption? Well, I think first of all we're going to close the loopholes of existing laws. There are a lot of laws on the books about pay to play and conflicts of interest. But, there's, but actually, there's, there's actually pay to play laws. On there the are books? yes, there are restrictions, but there's so many loopholes in them that people immediately from day one, from the time they're, they've already figured out where the loopholes are. I'll give you an example. Go ahead. Muhlenberg Hospital. Okay. Let's, get, right, let's, get, let's put the meat on the table, okay? <laughs> Muhlenberg Hospital. All right. Largest employer in Plainfield. Sure. The primary care facility for at least three or four towns minimum in the area. Yes, yes, without a doubt. The hospital's been around for 130 years. Yes, yes. It takes 60 days to shut it down. Shut it down. Now, why wasn't the current assemblyman and assemblywoman standing locked, chained to a tree in front of Muhlenberg Hospital to prevent that from closing down? Even if they couldn't have stopped it. Sure. Why didn't we see more out of them to stop it? Well, I don't know the answer for sure, but it makes you wonder when Assemblyman Jerry Green is on the payroll of the Almond Group, a lobbyist firm out of Westfield, whose client happened to be Solaris. Okay. He was getting paid $50,000 a year for community whatever he was doing, I don't know. Um, he didn't disclose it until it became known publicly, and when it did, he resigned within 24 hours. Now... You have proof of on this here. All, it's, all, it's all a matter of public record. Wow, okay. My question is, first of all, why would a sitting state assemblyman be on the payroll of a lobbyist firm? Now, I'm not saying it was illegal. Sure. What I'm saying is that's one of those loopholes that needs to be closed because you cannot represent a lobbyist firm and their client's interest at the same time representing your constituents' interests. That's a conflict of interest. Sure. That's a situation where I believe we need to do a better job of closing the loopholes that prevent, that, that leave open those potential conflicts of interest. There are other circumstances around the state. We all know what happened this over the summer when we had, you know, 40 elected politicians in the state of New Jersey rounded up. Of course, of course. I was down at, uh, uh, <laughs> trying to get some footage of myself for the show. Yeah. I was down at uh, the federal building when they were bringing them in Newark. Why is this happening? But but you know in New Jersey, well I I I have to say that I've seen this happen many numerous times in New Jersey. It's like every <laughs> every twenty four month <laughs> thing. Yeah. Sting. Right. No no. So I wonder so, right now who's you know under so, uh, under the under the gun right now. So maybe so maybe the point is is that we need to really focus on why does this keep happening? Sure. And we need to really root out the problem and make these laws. And restrictions a little with a little more teeth. Okay. And 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 maybe the penalties would prevent people from from walking into that water. Okay. Jerry Green is walking in it as we speak now. How you doing, Assemblyman? Yeah, how are you? Okay. Let's see. How you doing? Beautiful day. Okay. Jerry Green is here at this at this point. Uh, we were talking. I don't know whether you. Got to hear it from the car, or whatever that um, about a lobbyist or something like that that you were a part of or something. Well, how were you saying that? Right here? Yeah. Well, we, what we were talking about is is how we can how we can improve the the state's situation with regards to corruption and and conflicts of interest and pay to play. And the example that I gave was that you know for me, not I'm not saying, and I specifically stated that there wasn't anything illegal, Sure. but at the time when you were on the payroll at the Almond Group, uh, which is a lobbyist firm, um, that you were an elected official, and that that situation might have created a conflict of interest between the, the needs of the constituency and the needs of the Almond Group's clients. That they might be in conflict with one another versus eliminating that potential conflict of interest. Well, first of all, I apologize for being late. I was down in the meeting, Trenton. Okay. And uh, if we want to talk about this particular issue, then I would like to bring some clarification to it. Uh, 